I love that part of your book where you were kind of talking about your time singing in bars. And I think one of the things you wrote, I took notes. I was like, you love to, I love to observe people. I watch love and life play out in a million ways. <clears throat> but one of the best things I learned was this, you don't outrun pain. And I highlighted that because it was such a amazing lesson to learn. I mean, probably a very difficult lesson, but it seemed like such an important lesson to learn when you were, you were really young, right? At the time, like um, how, how old were you when you were singing in, in these bars? Uh, it started at age eight. Um, yeah, you know, there's a, the buffalo is the only animal that goes directly into the storm. And that image really struck me that the quickest way is through. The quickest way is through. Avoidance, you know, everybody's obsessed with hacks now. You don't get to hack spirituality. You don't get to hack pain. No. The only genuine shortcut is through, is going toward what you're uncomfortable with. And if you can recalibrate that you start moving toward uncomfortable things, uh, moving toward your anxiety, moving toward the uncomfortable parts of your personality, and you start to look at them with curiosity, that's the only, that's the only genuine shortcut. It took me a long time to learn that. Like, I think I started learning that when I was in my late twenties and early thirties, how were you able to apply that to your life when you were that young? Because you were dealing with a lot of pain, right? You were dealing with, you know, your dad, your mom left, your, your dad was uh, drinking and abusive sometimes. How did, did you kind of process and know all that then? Or, or was that something that took you a while to learn? My languaging around it is obviously much different now. At the time, you know, I think when I was eight, I just knew you couldn't avoid pain. I knew that. I knew you could not run it. Um, and I promised myself to try and handle it as it came, um, which I didn't have great skills for, you know. But telling the truth was a big part of that. Now, I only did it in a notebook. You know, I'd started lying a lot at that age. Uh, I started stealing at that age. So it wasn't like my behaviors were great or perfect. But, you know, I was lying to try and make myself seem more lovable than I was, to seem more perfect than I was. You know, a lot of, we all kind of start to do that. We all start to alter our authenticity in an effort to be accepted. When, when you're raised in an abusive household, you're trying to figure out that puzzle of why doesn't my dad be, why isn't he nice to me? But I realized, you know, I remember, it's funny, I remember where I was, I was walking up these stairs in this little cabin I was raised in, and I was... I was struck by this image of Hansel and Gretel. And I was like, if I keep lying, I won't remember who I am. And it, it, it paralyzed me that Scott, that thought scared me immensely. And I thought about like breadcrumbs back to who I was, as I was starting to construct this other version of who I was. And I went to writing again. And so I, I made this promise that I would always tell the truth in one place. It's funny. It brings tears to my eyes. And that it would be in my notebook and nobody ever read that notebook, but I told the truth there and it was hard, but what a skill to build on later, because that ended up being a very foundational thing, just like the idea of not trying to outrun pain became a foundational thing. So I didn't know what to do with these pieces yet, but for some reason, intuitively, I knew that these things, my survival depended on them. It felt that way.